I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Brigadier General Jeffrey Weiss, an active duty Air Force officer currently serving on the Joint Staff in the Operations Directorate. Brigadier General Weiss has civilian experience as a systems engineer, and his military experience includes wartime operational, USAF, and Joint Headquarters staff, as well as command leadership positions in Homeland Air Defense, Air and Missile Defense, Theater Air Battle Management, Command and Control, Nuclear Deterrence, and Information Influence Operations. He's commanded at the wing, group, and squadron levels and holds four master's degrees in military and aeronautical study areas, including an MS in National Security Strategy from the National War College. His articles have appeared in Air and Space Power Journal and the Joint Force Quarterly. And today we are discussing his book, The New Art of War, The Origins, Theory, and Future of Conflict. So, Jeffrey, welcome back, sir. And again, let me thank you so much for your tremendous service to our country. Uh, th thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Well, so today we're talking about, actually, we're talking about your book, also the conflict in Ukraine. And, and the hope was that we can apply some of the lessons from your book to basically what's going on right now in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So I, let me start out by asking, Overall, I guess, um, can you share some of your thoughts and opinions on what's happening in this conflict? Yeah, so I think uh, I think as we work through your questions, we'll definitely get around to to a lot of a lot of that. And, and you mentioned thoughts and opinions, so I do want to say uh, I'm here wholly in an unofficial capacity uh, with you. My comments are my own yeah. and don't represent any uh, government agency, service, or department. Um, I also want to I also want to let you know, Tim, that I, I don't think there's anyone out there doing uh, more frequent, relevant or thought provoking interviews. So it's really an honor to be here with you. Um, so let me just begin by by saying um, uh, so my book, uh, The New Art of War, uh, published by Cambridge last year, um, is doing very well. Uh, but with Amazon has been the number one bestseller on numerous occasions uh, in the military sciences up there with military history, et cetera. Uh, so I'm very, very honored about that. And, and I think the reason it's doing well is because uh, of the value of war theory and analysis and the preparation of war fighters and strategists, because war theory tells us what's true about war, distill, distills those abstract truths, um, and then it, it enables us to use those uh, in any to analyze any conflict, whether past, uh, present or, or even to, to consider the future. And so good war theory is always relevant. Uh, and I think that's why uh, this book in particular, because it distills all the best past theory and then uh, introduces a unified war theory that's 100 percent applicable to contemporary wars, multi-domain war, uh, high technology, all those sorts of things, I think is extremely val valuable and that it extends the masters into the contemporary. Um, so let me just say about this. Uh, we're here talking, of course, about uh, Ukraine and so this conflict is a big deal. Um, in many respects, it's a world war. Uh, we're seeing alignment in one way or another uh, with most major powers, either behind uh, Ukraine or Russia, uh, mainly on east-west lines. Uh, not surprising there, NATO and the U.S. supporting Ukraine, uh, China, Iran, countries like that supporting Russia. Um, as Thucydides said of the Peloponnesian War, all the players aligned like iron filings with, behind either Athens and Sparta. So we're seeing that sort of thing here. So and at least from Russia's perspective, uh, this was supposed to be a quick war. But as I highlight in my book, war seldom go as planned. Uh, Putin failed to heal. He failed to heed, uh, in my opinion, the, the most fundamental yet elusive guidance from Sun Tzu, which is know the enemy and know yourself. And Putin really did neither. And now he's sort of uh, stuck uh, in a situation and he's paying pay, he and Russia and certainly his troops are paying a very high price. Mm. Well, you know, and again, I, I should reiterate, you know, all of the opinions that you're sharing are your own. They don't represent the United States government, or the United States military in any capacity. Um, I also wanted to point out the reason that I am so grateful for your time today is because in your book, The New Art of War, and if you could hold that up again, that that is an amazing book, what you've done is distilled, I mean, thousands of years of military history down into a set of core principles that really apply to all levels of the conflict. And, you know, when I went through it, one of the things that blew me away is 
it seems like everyone has kind of their favorite authors or their favorite military strategists, right? And like a few of yours include like Sun Tzu and Clausewitz. Um, but at the same time, you're also canvassing this, this incredible scope of history, including modern technologies like cyber warfare. So it doesn't just end with cannons. You know, you take it all the way through the Cold War into the modern era. Um, so, uh, you know, on that note, l let me give a little background on the Russian, the Russo-Ukrainian War, which started in February 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea. So there were basically this, this kind of low-grade series of naval incidents, cyber warfare, and heightened political attentions, political tensions for the next eight years until Russia launched a full invasion in February 22. So that's just about one year ago. As you've said, they expected a quick victory, but almost a year later, they're still failing to meet their objectives. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what the major flaws have been in their strategy? Uh, yeah, I mean, we could talk about all kinds of flaws, uh, but I think, first of all, I want to say it's great you take it back to the Crimea annexation, and, and honestly, the history goes far back behind beyond that. But in modern times, you can certainly trace it back to theirs as the kind of the first moves by the Putin uh, regime. I, honestly, they're not even the first moves. Uh, we could go back again to political machinations and so forth, but um, so some of the real kind of overt moves when it looked like uh, Russia was not going to get what they wanted politically. So this case is actually the Crimea annexations highlighted in my book and what's commonly called gray zone type things now, you know, little little green men and all that sort of thing. Uh, but in my book, I systematically define, you know, gray zones a little ambiguous. And I talk about, you know, four zones uh, and the two kind of for that would, would include competition and then conflict, kind of short of, of all out reciprocal violence, which highlights war. Um, but, but to the question of why Russia's failing, um, if Putin had read my book, he would know that in war, uh, and not just my book, many, many theorists have said this, of course, because it's true, uh, is that the will to fight is what's paramount, not physical capacity. Um, what I do in my book is I, is I make that a little bit more tangible and useful as a, as a strategic concept in saying that the will to fight is like a roof supported by psychological pillars uh, among these things like leadership, training, morale, motivation, courage, uh, moral enablers. And then those pillars then rest on a foundation of physical capacity. So uh, a lot of times we think physical capacity is paramount, but it's really just a foundation for the psychological element um, to, to sit on. So uh, so Russia did not uh, adequately account for the psychological elements. They looked at their physical capacity and thought this would be easy, um, and that wasn't the case. So also in my book, I highlight the, the four essential acts of strategy, uh, the first of those being to define the political aim. And then the second one is where we really assess what we have or what we can obtain, ways and means to support the, the, the political objective that we've um, set out for ourselves. And, and you really must have an understanding of the difference between the nature and character of war and the will to fight and these sorts of things. And this is where uh, Putin uh, fell, fell very short and where most people do, because that's where the decision to fight or not to fight. The, set, the third and the fourth uh, essential acts are the Implementation Act and then the Adjustment Act, which is uh, where you have to say, okay, things have changed and now how does my strategy have to change? So Putin has underestimated uh, Ukrainian will to fight, so the psychological component. He overestimated his own forces, their will to fight, um, and he placed way too much uh, value in the, in, the, uh, in the overwhelming physical capacity, which again is just the foundation. Without the pillars, the will to fight is, is weak. And so mm. Ukraine has eroded that capacity. It's been, the, the capacity has been reinforced by the West. And then Putin has seen his misfortunes accelerate, uh, which is to say, you know, you're looking at a major conventional and nuclear power, which is at a stalemate uh, with tens of thousands of ca casualties, uh, a wrecked economy and only a small slice of Ukraine to show for it. And so the uh, the strategic blunders of, of Putin and Russia are manifold in this case. Yeah. Well, so let me jump around on my questions a little bit, it, because in terms of will to fight, the Ukrainians are fighting for their lives, whereas young Russian men, I did a little bit of research on this last night, reportedly are fleeing the country to escape the draft. They are getting, quote unquote, beat up for refusing to fight. 
And th the desertion rate is so high that Russia has reportedly set up a second front line just to kill its deserters. So I mean, what are your thoughts on this, this tremendous disparity in morale? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a Russia has taken a very Machiavellian approach um, to, to how they to the whole thing, including to how they're actually uh, fighting the war. And so, I mean, morale is one of the most important pillars. Uh, the, the late uh, war and strategy expert Colin Gray said it, morale is actually the single most important contributor to military success. Uh, George Marshall uh, said that, you know, it's morale that wins the victory. Um, so it's played a huge role in this conflict. You're just not, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves, right? And in this case, um, the, that morale at the lowest levels is is extremely poor on the Russian side. I mean, the the Ukrainians are fighting, as you said, for their lives, for their homes. Uh, again, that goes to the motivation pillar, which is closely tied to morale uh, and the, uh, the the psychological component. Uh, and so uh, those those Russian uh, fighters are they they thought they were in an exercise when this kicked off now they have no choice right they're there uh they're not allowed to turn around now their their motivation is literally individual survival which is a powerful motivator and armies in, in the past have used that as a motivation but it is not as strong as fighting for your home country fighting for your for your loved ones and that is a significant reason why again that we're looking at a nuclear power we're looking at a major conventional power um, at a stalemate and holding just a sliver of what their original objective was. And honestly, uh, in a situation where they're, they're not entirely sure what to do uh, to, to, get, to, to get their objectives accomplished. Yeah, yeah. Well, in terms of how this is playing out so far, both sides appear to be taking heavy casualties. Uh, the latest research that I did shows that Russia is also taking heavy losses in their leadership, so over 100,000 Russian casualties so far. That's not necessarily dead, but that is casualties, right? Including wounded. That's right. Including at least, and the, the estimates vary on this. Uh, the Ukrainians have said up to 160 generals have been killed. Um, I, I think the more official estimates are they've lost 29 generals and over 800 senior lieutenants in the first nine months of this conflict. Um, so I guess one of the next things I wanted to ask was, how do you think it affects Russia to lose this many experienced leaders in such a short period of time? Right. Well, well, the obvious answer, Tim, is is it's uh, it, it, it's devastating. Um, leadership is a very important pillar. Uh, when we don't have confidence in our leaders, uh, we have a very hard time remaining motivated to fight. Uh, again, um, this is a, a major psychological pillar. It affects the moral enabler, enablers of courage and confidence. Uh, these leaders are the, the fact that they're being killed is is, a, is immediate and tangible proof of the failure of their their strategy and the fail, failure of their tactics. Uh, and then it just it, it completely erodes uh, confidence, uh, morale, particularly at the operational and tactical level. It does not. Uh, it makes it look as though these leaders don't are not competent. Uh, and one of the things that doesn't get reported that much is that uh, th there's a double effect of the loss of these officer leaders, because the Russian army in particular is notoriously poor in the character uh, and, and quality of its non-commissioned officer corps. So what's that next echelon of the enlisted leadership that are really the ones that are down in the trenches making things happen? Uh, with that being poor and then the officers also being poor, you're just in a, in a very difficult uh, situation. Uh, and it's a recipe for continued failures, um, particularly when you consider uh, that Russia is trying to send more raw recruits into the mix. Who's going to train those recruits? Who's going to lead those recruits? Who's going to prove uh, that they have the capability and the capacity, the character, charisma uh, to be successful as a leader? Um, that is just a, a, a recipe, again, for uh, continued problems for the Russians. Yeah, yeah. What? So let, let me change topics a little bit. I wanted to touch on supply logistics. This one, actually, I this for me, this started with, um, it was an article about the U.S. Navy saying they were having logistical issues resupplying because so many weapons are being sent to Ukraine. But 
Right now, Russia is reportedly running low on missiles and ammunition. They've depleted their stockpiles enough that they are reportedly firing 40-year-old artillery shells, which has taken the failure rate on those just through the roof. Um, now, on the other side of this, Ukraine is using so much ordnance that European and American arms manufacturers are, uh, say that they are struggling to meet demand. They literally can't keep up. With it and the u.s military again is reportedly running low on some munitions from sending so much to ukraine so when i read this i read it th bits and pieces i was just like that's that to me that's mind-blowing it's mind-blowing to be using that much ordinance I, what are your thoughts on that well i think it's consistent in some ways this um war has been described as a world war one style um is what it's what it's reverted to um, so what happens when you're in that sort of situation uh, is you get a balance of you get a balance of power effect. That's why, you know, it, it bogs down into a stalemate. This is uh, it, you can find it in numerous places in my book, how that uh, occurs, how that decision making process and how and how once you're in a balance of power situation, whether it's a, a, at the national, you know, international level or at the tactical level. It becomes extremely difficult to decide what to do other than to try to escalate in terms of, you know, munitions and firepower. Mm -hmm. This is what they did in World War One is they they tried to mass uh, fires and charge. Uh, and so you have a, a similar thing here. It's bogged down. It's become a war of attrition, largely due to the fact that neither side is capable to do what we know as modern warfare, which would be multi-domain operations with, with uh, integrated air power, combined arms, those types of things. It's very much an artillery infantry trenches situation. And so uh, it comes down to who will run out of mu munitions first. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if the other side stops firing and can no longer fire, now my charge can be effective. I go across the, the uh, line of departure and, and I can overwhelm because I still have bullets in my gun, uh, if nothing else. And so both sides, absent some other game changing capability, means they're going to be scrambling to try to find ways to arm. Uh, and this is a challenge for the West and for and for the Russians. And so it is very much a race, a logistics race at this point, unless some other game changing capability can be found. And we might talk about that a little bit later. But um, how, you know, at, at this point, uh, the next six months are going to tell a lot as to whose stockpiles can be replenished. Um, or unless some other uh, variable can be changed here. And I'm not super optimistic about that happening. So uh, logistics, as you pointed out, uh, who's, who's got some capability and the, and the pillars, the psychological pillars, although they're more important than capacity, they rest on capacity. So if you have nothing to work with, uh, you're going to lose some morale. And honestly, I think that hurts Russia more because I don't think that their psychological pillars are anywhere near as strong as Ukraine. So you know, all things being equal with in terms of capacity, uh, Ukraine has the advantage. Yeah, yeah. Well, so in terms of technological advancements, as well as change, um, the headlines right now today are full of announcements about shipments of tanks from NATO member nations to support the Ukrainians. So the, the Ukrainians, they already had tanks. They were using old Soviet era tanks. They were using those against the newer Russian tanks, I guess, on the battlefield. Um, there has been talk about a spring offensive, and it, it, from what I've read, um, you definitely have Leopard tanks coming from six or seven NATO members, um, possibly Abrams tanks from the United States, and uh, I understand that France is talking about sending some of their make tanks as well. Um, do you think that this, how does this change the conflict, and do you think that this escalates the conflict? Yeah, great, great questions. Uh, you know, uh, I sort of look at this as the uh, as the stone soup strategy. You know what I mean? Like you, you come and, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that someone has a stone, they ask somebody for a carrot and somebody else for an onion and somebody else for some salt. And, you know, even though they didn't bring all that stuff to it, eventually they end up with, with soup. So we have a, you know, we're going out all over the place, uh, both sides trying to get, uh, um, get different things uh, to, to break the stalemate here and, and put together a, a winning, uh, some winning capacity. In World War I, it was blackjack Pershing. Uh, you know, the air weapon and the tank were relatively nascent. They, they weren't able to really break through. Mm. They did a little bit toward the end. Um, but certainly, you know, again, World War I style conflict, we're not seeing the introduction of air power, although that's certainly something that we could discuss um, and is being discussed. Um, 
uh, right now. Uh, you know, the Russians have have it, but you know, it's more or less neutral neutralized on, on both sides. You're seeing a lot of uh, UAVs and stuff. So, so you know, can we bring the tank back in, make it relevant? You know, mechanized warfare, maneuver, faster speed, breakthroughs, all those kind of things. So both sides will be trying to do that. What you're seeing is, uh, you know, on the West with what everything you're talking about is the introduction of, of weapons that are designed to do just that. They're designed to break through static lines. You know, will the terrain support that? Will the weather support that? Will all these other, other factors support that? That remains to be seen. Um, but, the, but the point is uh, to bring enough capacity uh, in to uh, change Russia's strategic calculus and get them to abandon their designs. The big question is, you know, will it be enough? Um, the Russians, they're still seeking the same ad advantages. Again, um, one of the things I highlight in my book is that uh, the form of war, you know, war is really a lot about um, achieving a localized relative capacity advantage and then exploiting that to contain the, and destroy the adversary. And so can they do that um, or, can, or will we see a balance of power? Again, we're seeing an influx, like you said, of, of potentially of tanks while this plays out. Um, the Russians also, you know, they're familiar with with that. Um, and so both sides will be will be vying. And so the question is, again, um, will it prove decisive? Will there be a breakthrough? Will it force the other side to change its strategic calculus uh, under the fourth essential act of strategy uh, remains to be seen? It, it is it, it is interesting now since you since you'd gotten into air power so there there are some different aspects of this one of them is i have heard that f-16 jets are something that may be sent to ukraine i've also heard what you'd said that russia already has air capacity but it's basically been neutralized because of air defenses and so that's taken it back to more of kind of a land battle and it's eliminated a lot of the multi-domain capabilities right so that's right yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely on both sides. And I mean, we saw a lot of it early on and there was a lot of uh, capability lost um, on both sides. And, and so there's a fear factor now of, you know, losing, uh, you know, multi, multi million dollar airplanes, you know, to cheap missiles. Um, because frankly, the, you know, the doctrine and the training, uh, you know, not everyone can do it and make it look as easy as the United States. Uh, in yeah. That respect. That's what, yeah. Saying, so. Um, but certainly, I mean, you know, the, so we're, ta we're talking about, you know, air, air power, again, raising it to another domain. Air defenses are extremely difficult, you know, to, to deal with that. Um, you know, so it has the potential to be escalatory, of course. Um, we've heard plenty of rhetoric in the open source uh, confirming the Russians view air power that way. They're, they're saying the same things about tanks, frankly, in the open source. Um, so they're going to always be against it. Um, what can they do about it? Not a whole lot. But I think it, I think one of the things we have to highlight is there's a big difference between, um, you know, Ukrainians using Western weapons against Russians in Ukraine uh, and NATO or U.S. persons using those weapons against Russia in Ukraine. Or if those Rush, if those weapons are actually going into Russia proper itself, um, those are those are the types of things that could certainly lead to escalation. Um, without also um, necessarily proving decisive, without, um, you know, the ability to maintain, sustain, train, uh, and, uh, and, you know, those are the sorts of things you need with air power. It's very technologically intensive, uh, and without the rest of the things that go with it, you know, an F-16 is not going to do a lot by itself. It needs a pilot, it needs a maintainer, it needs mun munitions, it needs fuel, it needs escort aircraft. It needs intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance to dope out the, the air picture. Uh, so, so it's not as simple as I'm just going to introduce. And the same is true for tanks. Um, some some weapon, and that's somehow going to change everything. There's a lot that goes with it. And so, I think people just need to recognize that it's it's a very complicated and not necessarily simple. Yeah, yeah. Well, in terms of potential escalations, and I, you know, I've I've kind of heard the rumblings. I'm sure that we all have. I believe Dmitry Medved alluded gently to the use of nuclear weapons but then i've i've also heard a lot saying that russia's nuclear doctrine prohibits this unless russia itself is directly threatened uh, do you see any potential for escalation in that direction or do you think this is just remain a conventional war yeah i mean i as i point out in my book you know uh first of all you know war, wars can be very unpredictable um, uh, you know, and rules and doctrine and treaties, they serve a purpose. But honestly, um, 
as soon as that purpose comes at odds with survival or the political objective, a lot of times we see uh, rules and doctrine and so forth dismissed or ignored. So we have to think as a strategist, um, yes, Russia has these rules, but like, are there reasons why they would they would violate those rules mm. uh, that would cause that adversary to, to throw it out the window? Uh, I discuss nuclear weapons a lot in my book. Um, they're extraordinarily important strategically. Um, it's why it's why we um, hold on to ours and why a lot of relatively marginal but controversial countries like North Korea and Iran, for example, are pursuing them or, or, or try to get them. Um, you know, if you look at the U.S., I mean, you know, we, uh, you know, invaded Iraq. If they'd had nuclear weapons, we probably wouldn't have done that. You know, if Ukraine had had nuclear weapons, Russia probably wouldn't have invaded Ukraine. And, you know, you can go on and on. Taiwan, you know, take note. Um, so, in, but in, in war, obviously, there's a chance for miscalculation. But I think uh, in my estimation, again, my personal opinion is that the chance of this turning nuclear is very low. I think um, there's nothing that the U.S. or NATO has that would rise to the level of us, you know, using nuclear weapons. Um, with respect to Russia, uh, first of all, I think, you know, it would be they, they, they understand it would be escalatory. They understand their opponents are nuclear armed countries, NATO, the United States, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of saber rattling because Russia wants to scare the West away from interfering in this conflict. Uh, you know, that makes perfect sense. Uh, it sounds very scary, um, but, it, but what Russia, what Putin's really saying is saying, hey, look, you know, don't mess with me directly. Um, yeah. I'm a nuclear armed country, so don't mess with me directly. Um, but, but, you know, what's happening in Ukraine, though, very important to Putin, I don't think rise to the level of an existential problem. Where we have to be concerned is if we think something morphs in such a way that Putin feels that his hold on power, uh, and Putin is the center of gravity here, make no mistake. It's not the Russian people. It's not their armed forces. Uh, you know, this war is going to go as Putin goes, at least from the Russian side. Um, you know, if Putin decides that his future is at stake, et cetera, uh, then we have to be more concerned. But I don't think it's at that level right now, and it's not really likely to, to be that way unless the West actually escalates it to that level. And again, I don't think that's going to happen. So there's a lot of safeguards, definitely something to talk about, definitely something to be concerned about. Um, but in, again, in my personal, you know, unofficial opinion, I, I don't, I don't think the, um, the chance is high for uh, going to a nuclear escalation. In this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, so in our first interview, one of the things that I had asked about was, um, is it possible to use military strategy, military theory to try and find some kind of a political off ramp in terms of continued escalation? Right. And I know that's challenging, especially now that a hot war is broken out. But that question kind of resonates in my mind. It's like, OK, if if we have an idea in general terms where things are going, and as you've mentioned, it looks like both sides are basically just kind of kind of slug it out like two boxers in the ring until one of them drops. You know, is is there a way to use some of these principles to find a way out? I guess. Well, well, yes, and and you know, at the heart, I mean, if you want to think of it from a theoretical standpoint, so we have our political objectives; they have their political objectives. You know, at the heart is political survival, and and again, that's where I think we're not at that level with any of the nuclear armed countries. So I think, from a nuclear standpoint, I think we definitely have a lot of trade space for de-escalation. Uh, I think we know what we think our red lines are. Um, and, you know, again, I, I won't uh, comment specifically on anything like that, but I, I will just say generally in, in abstract terms, you know, any any country's red line is going to be, you know, where they feel like their their most vital uh, survival in, uh, interests are, are put at stake. And I don't think that's the question between the nuclear countries at this part. And we know mistakes can be made, so I don't necessarily even think a, a small mistake will will lead to that, um, but it will definitely, uh, it could escalate tension. So I would just say, you know, as far as like the war itself and de-escalating, de uh, you know, what has to happen is there has to be some kind of common ground politically um, between the two sides. So really Russia and Ukraine, you know, and the West. The West is not dictating to Ukraine what to do. Uh, they're, you know, they're defending their country and they're and they're using every trick at their disposal to get help. Yeah. Uh, you know, on Russia's side, um, you know, Putin has invested a lot. There's a lot of sunk costs on both sides. And right now, I think there's very little chance of de-escalation out of a war until uh, both sides feel that they have no other alternative and no, nothing else to turn to to a, to a breakthrough. 
because essentially they're each side, Putin side and, and Ukraine side. Um, they're mutually exclusive. And that's why they're not even, I mean, they can't even agree on a place to go or when to be there. People are trying to broker peace. I mean, people are trying to offer solutions on both sides, but but it always runs into uh, Ukraine will not accept uh, Russians on its territory and the Russians will not accept giving up anything that they already have. And so there's no place to kind of begin a discussion until one side forces the other one to do to do it, um, they'll have to continue. And what I will point out, one more thing about theory is, it, is that these things are reciprocal. So war is reciprocal. Someone decides to fight, someone else decides to fight back uh, every time. Well, the peace part is reciprocal too. Because, I mean, Putin may say, I'm happy with what I have right now, but if, but if Ukraine, and, and I'll stop fighting if you'll just agree that, you know, I can keep what I have, but Putin has to agree to that. If, I mean, if one side stops fighting, that's not OK. Uh, it's not the end of the war unless the other side agrees to stop fighting, too. And so um, so that's kind of where we sit right now. Yeah. Jeffrey, let me thank you again so much for your time today. It's truly an honor to be able to interview you. And thank you so much for helping provide context on this. I want to remind everyone to look in the YouTube show notes for the link to buy the new art of war. Um, again, let me thank you so much for your career of service as well. It, it has been a true pleasure and an honor to have you with me today, sir. Uh, it's been an honor for me, Tim. Thanks for uh, providing this forum. And again, like, I don't think anyone can match uh, the relevance and incisiveness you bring uh, day in and day out to this medium. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see uh, how this plays out. There's a long way to go. And, um, We'll be paying attention closely, and I, I do think that uh, my book is an excellent way to understand, um, you know, exactly what's going on, and then you know, kind of plug that into uh, into our uh, bank to do analysis on on how it may play out. Absolutely. Thank you again, sir. Thanks, Tim.